Okay, everybody, welcome back. As we transition into inferential statistics, we need to start talking about probability. And that's because, as I've mentioned before, inferential statistics is really based on a foundation of probability. And here's the bottom line. If we're going to learn from our sample data and be able to apply that information to some population, we need to make sure that we understand how that sample actually relates to the population. And the way that we do that is through probability. So, but right now we're just going to begin some basic discussions about probability. Let's first talk about what it means to have statistically significant results, because that's, that's really what we're shooting for. We want to understand how to compute if we have statistically significant results. And more importantly, we want to understand what that means. And as I've mentioned, it's based on probability. So let's talk about that a little bit. Statistically significant results, does it mean that they are big? Does it mean that they are important? That's what most people would probably think when posed with this question. But in general, when we're talking about how big results are or how important those results are, we're talking about something like practical significance or clinical significance, not really statistical significance. So are statistically significant results just simply too confusing to understand? Some students want to come into this discussion with that mindset, and I'm really encouraging you not to do that. The answer really here is none of the above. Let's make sure that we understand what we're talking about here, because really I can sum it up in a pretty straightforward way. A result is statistically significant if it's unlikely to have occurred by chance. It's, it's that easy at this point in terms of summing it up. So as you're studying, make sure you have that sentence in your mind. What we are doing when we determine if we have statistically significant results is ruling out the possibility that the results we have found have occurred just simply due to chance or sampling error. So a result is statistically significant if it is unlikely to have occurred by chance. Now that, of course, will bring up some other interesting questions. You know, like how unlikely do those results need to be? Well, we have some conventions put in place, some cutoff points. So, for example, the probability of results occurring by chance typically need to be less than 0.05 or 5% in order to be considered statistically significant. And when you're talking about 5%, you're talking about like one chance in 20. There are some other common significance levels, though. Um, 0.05 is definitely the most common. We, we see that mostly uh, in journal articles that you'd be looking at if you're in psychology or sociology or nursing. Um, but now more hardcore medical journals typically require a little bit more evidence to show that they have statistically significant results. So often then the probability that we're looking at would be 0.01. Um, or 0 0.001. Here we're talking about one chance in a hundred. So in order to say that we have statistically significant results, we have to make sure that we're saying these results would only occur by chance, about one out of every 100 times. And here we'd be saying that the results have occurred by chance only about one in every thousand times. So we're trying to rule out the probability that the results have happened just due to chance. Let's go through a brief example. And here we're going to talk about what we're talking about as um, subjective statistical significance. So this kind of is to point out to you how much we need some clear process that will arrive at a quantitative value for determining statistical significance. Because in this situation, you're going to see when we're just kind of trying to determine if we have statistically significant results in a subjective manner, it gets a little bit tough. So an experiment tests whether a new herbal treatment is effective in preventing colds. Over three months, 100 people in a treatment group take the herbal formula, while 100 people in a control group take the placebo. And let's assume that they were randomly assigned to both those groups, so it's a good experiment. Results show that 30 people in the treatment group got colds compared to 32 people in the control group. Control group. Can we conclude that the herbal treatment is effective in preventing colds? Let's think about this for a second. We're looking at 30 people in the treatment group getting colds. That is less than 32 people in the control group, but I'm sure you're probably not real impressed by these differences. It's hardly a, a compelling story that's being told about this herbal formula preventing colds. 
And what I'm seeing here is I would expect this type of difference to occur probably just by chance, even if this treatment has no effect at all on reducing colds. And as we look at statistical significance in a subjective way like that, that's exactly the type of uh, solution that we, would, that we would find in this case. Even if the treatment was completely ineffective, we wouldn't expect the two groups to have exactly the same number of people with colds. Then that's just due to chance variation. The difference between 30 and 32 people getting colds is small enough to be explained by chance variation. The difference is not statistically significant. Um, and in this case, we would not conclude that the treatment is effective. So we do not have enough evidence in this case to say that the treatment is effective. We do not have statistically significant results. Now let's, let's look at that solution that we, that we just came up with. This subjective method really leaves us wanting a little bit more. It's handy, but it's very vague. I mean, how big did that difference need to be between 30 and 32 for us to determine that we had statistically significant results? That's why we're going to want a more quantitative approach to measuring statistical significance. And that's where that whole 0 0.05, 0 0.01, or 0.001 comes into play. We're going to determine a significance level. And then that probability level will determine if we have enough evidence to say that we have statistically significant results or not. And that would take us to this next example right here. When testing the Salk polio vaccine, 33 out of 200,000 children in the treatment group got paralytic polio. So those are the, the kids that are actually taking the polio vaccine. 33 out of 200,000 got paralytic polio. But this was compared to 115 of the 200,000 in the control group who did not receive the new vaccine. Remember, they got some type of control treatment. It was a placebo. Now, that's a big difference, right? This is telling a much more compelling story. We're looking at the same number of people in each group, 200,000 in the control group, 200,000 in the treatment group. 33 acquired polio in the treatment group. 115 in the control group. That's like three and a half times as many people in the group who received the actual um, treatment. So we can compute that probability. And we'll learn, we'll learn how to do this later on. For right now, I'm just going to give you this information. The probability of finding the difference by chance is less than 0.01. It's less than one chance in 100 that we would find a difference between 33 and 115 like that. What's the probability of finding a difference like this? 33 out of 200,000 compared to 115 out of 200,000 just by chance. You wouldn't find that very often. The probability is less than 1 in 100. So is that result statistically significant? Well, using the 0.05 criterion, which is what is typically used, as I mentioned, the result is statistically significant because we would expect to find those differences fewer than five times out of every 100. And that's why we would typically see in a journal article that after they do statistical tests, um, the authors would say that the probability of finding those results by chance is less than 0.05. And by seeing that P less than 0.05 next to a statistical test, we would see that it's statistically significant. So what that's helping us understand is that we can be confident that the vaccine is responsible for fewer cases of polio. We can be confident that we have ruled out chance. That's a good thing. Here's another example. Let's just make sure we're getting the hang of it. Researchers measured the body temperature of 200 people and found that the mean for the sample was 98.4 degrees Fahrenheit. The accepted value for body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's always what I've learned, what, what a normal temperature is. Well, what's the, what's the probability of finding that difference? If we were to measure 200 people and the real typical average temperature for a human body is 98.6, what's the probability that we would find when we measure those 200 people that the average is 98.4? Well, the probability of finding that value just by chance turns out to be 0.14, 14%. So we would expect to find a difference like this about 14% of the time, just by chance. Is the result statistically significant? Well, keep in mind, we're going to use that 0.05 criterion. The probability needs to be less than 5% for us to say that we have ruled out chance. Well, using the 0.05 criterion in this case, the result is clearly not statistically significant because we would expect to find these differences more than five times in every 100 samples. So in this case, 
Researchers would list in their journal article that the probability of finding these results by chance is greater than 5%. And this would show all of us who understand basic statistics that these results are not statistically significant. So here we didn't find any evidence that average body temperature is less than 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. This difference that we found here, we're marking up to simply chance, chance variation. So bottom line, we can't rule out chance as an explanation for the results. Let's kind of summarize a little bit here about those p-values, those probability values, and um, these significant levels that we tag them with, 0 0.05, 0 0.01, and 0 0.001. Just some summary statements here. If the probability of finding an observed difference is greater than 0.05, so if p is greater than 0.05, then we say the difference is not statistically significant. However, if the probability of finding some observed difference is less than or equal to 0.05, we would put down p less than 0.05, and then we would say that the difference is statistically significant at the 0.05 level. If the probability of finding an observed difference is less than or equal to 0.01, so here we'd write the probability p is less than 0.01, then we say that the difference is statistically significant at the 0.01 level. And then we'd be even more confident in our results. Because the bottom line is, if I can rule out chance at a smaller and smaller probability level, then I'm more confident that I've really ruled out chance. I mean, if, if chance results would just occur 5% of the time, that's pretty compelling. That's pretty good evidence that I've ruled out chance. But now, if I'm able to calculate that my results would occur by chance just 1% of the time, I've done an even better job of ruling out chance. So that's why we'd say that we'd be even more confident in our results. So that leads to a, a good question. If some observed difference is statistically significant at the 0.01 level, must it also be significant at the 0.05 level? And you can hit pause if you'd like and think about that. But the bottom line is, remember, we have essentially more confidence in our results if they're statistically significant at the 0.01 level compared to the 0.05 level because it, it would require more evidence to find statistically significant results at the 0.01 level. We've done an even better job of ruling out chance. So if our results are significant at the 0.01 level, then yes, they must be significant at the 0.05 level. But now flip that around for a second. Let me ask you the flip side of that question. If some observed difference is statistically significant at the 0.05 level, must it also be significant at the 0.01 level? Now again, you might want to hit pause and think about that for a second. But here's the answer. The answer is no. Because if my re results are statistically significant at the 0.05 level, that's great. That's compelling. I have enough evidence to say that I have statistically significant results. But I don't have the evidence that's required to rule out chance at the 0.01 level. That required more evidence. Those results would only occur one time out of every 100. So if the results are significant at the 0.05 level, they're not necessarily significant at the 0.01 level. Now, I can tell, of course, just by speaking to you about this stuff that this can get confusing. And this is likely what's going on in your head at this point. You know, you got these 0.05s and 0.01s kind of spinning around and P greater than and P less than. And it does get confusing, but we're just easing into it at this point. I want to make sure that you take appropriate time to look over this, this particular section. Because if you understand the basic logic of what we're talking about here, in terms of ruling out chance, how probability is linked to making these decisions about statistically significant results, then you'll better understand when we really start getting into the nitty gritty of computing probability and statistically significant results um, using actual calculations and formulas. So be sure to spend some time on this so that it becomes a little bit more clear. That, my friends, is the key content from Chapter 6, Section 1. And for now, that is all.